Hello, my name is Martin and welcome back to another video. I finally decided to come outside and take me exercise time. So it's a gorgeous day. We're on a big hillside. We're in the east of Manchester, just near the town of Ashton Underline. Over in the distance over there, I don't know if you can see it on that camera, on that lens, is Manchester city centre. Behind us is a place called Hartshead Pike. So I thought I'd come up here and have a walk up to the pike. So I'm gonna walk up there. When I get to the top, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the pike. In the meantime, we have got the usual magazine style video. I thought I'd present it from a beautiful hillside for a change. So what have we got coming up? Well, we've got this, 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 and this. So a fun pack show as per usual. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna walk up to the pike Right, you can just see the pike there. Can you see it there? That spike there, that is uh, Hartshead Pike. I'll just zoom in for you on the camera. That's where, where we're gonna walk up to. So on the way, got a few things to introduce to you. Let's go. Now, this being a very big hill overlooking the city and overlooking Ashton and Manchester, Apparently there's been some kind of beacon up here for many, many hundreds of years. The earliest one that people know about was in the 17th century. Apparently it was a bit of a wooden affair and believe it or not, apparently it got vandalised. Can you believe? Um, so it was replaced later on with a stone structure. Now <clears throat> I'm going to have to do my homework a little bit and I'll do a bit of a voiceover and give you some decent information. I think also there's a connection to King Canute up here. I didn't know he even existed. Is that not the guy that sat on the beach and uh, tried to turn the waves back? Don't know. We can just about see it now. I'll turn the camera around. Right, so before we get to the top, and we're nearly there, as promised in last week's video, our friend Dean, who does the music for us, has done a bit of a video for us about a local landmark in Stratford. So a few of you have been trying to guess what the landmark was. Well, now all's going to be revealed. So it's over to Dean and his report about a landmark in Stratford. Thank you very much, Dean. Hello. So this is just a quick intro from me and the backstory to the video. I'm Stratford born and raised and this particular landmark has always been a fascination of mine. When I was writing songs for my most recent album I came up with the song Baby Blue as sort of a tribute to the place and it's had an amazing response since I released it. So as Martin is doing these magazine style videos I thought it'd be the perfect opportunity to do some research and make a video explaining a little bit more about the history of this landmark that I've grown up with and I hope you find it interesting. So, what is that weird shaped building on Chester Road as you pass through Stretford? Well, it's had several names over its lifetime, but this began life as the Longford Super Cinema. It seems that it's a bit like Marmite for the locals, with many crying out for it to be saved, and others feeling it's an eyesore that should have been demolished years ago. People old enough to remember it in its heyday call it the finest cinema ever built. I would show you around, but this is just a big TV screen, and no member of the public has been inside for 25 years. So how about a history lesson instead? On the 14th of August 1936, the land where the building now stands was transferred to Jackson and Newport Limited, with construction said to have begun the year previous. Seen here is a sign advertising the new Super Cinema, which was under construction at the time. The sign read, Longford Super Cinema and Cafe, Roberts, Wood and Elder. Now, Henry F. Elder was the architect who designed the Longford when aged just 25. He was born in Pendleton in 1909 and spent his later years living and lecturing in Canada. 
In 1935, he joined forces with Aguilim Caradoc Roberts, and they have an impressive list of buildings to their credit. These include several cinemas and theatres around Manchester, and a number in Glasgow too. Interestingly, they also proposed designs for a large 2,000-seat egg-shaped cinema to be built in the centre of Manchester. It would have been constructed in reinforced concrete with the screen in the pointed end of the egg, which would have been supported on stilts. Sadly, World War II killed the scheme. Seriously though, could you imagine a massive egg in the centre of Manchester? Well, I think it's an excellent idea. Anyway, back to the Longford. It was funded by Jackson and Newport, who also owned the Pictodrome on the opposite corner of Chester Road. A cinema was really taking off by this time. They had planned to increase capacity at the Pictodrome by adding an extra balcony, but they found this wasn't possible, so they decided to build a new super cinema instead. Henry Elder was commissioned to design everything from the building itself to the interior concealed neon tube lighting. It was the first building in the country to have this. He also designed the carpets and even the uniforms of the cinema ushers. Every little detail was thought about. In the stalls lounge it said, Here one treads a carpet of green, designed specially by the architect, and arrives under a quaintly star-spangled ceiling of blue, two storeys high. The circle lounge was large, green carpeted, gold ceilinged, a room of softly diffused light and comfortable settees. The place was obviously so much more than the multiplexes that we're used to these days. The front of the building originally had a large forecourt leading to the main entrance. This was sadly demolished in the 1970s to make way for the widening of Chester Road. The main front of the building was cladded in faience, which is a ceramic glazed terracotta and it would have looked quite spectacular. Here we can see a glimpse into the past as the original tiling still hides behind the modern. Also seen here are the remains of the original marble floor, which still lies intact. The main façade, which is probably the building's most recognisable feature, was shaped to resemble an old-fashioned cash register to represent the money aspect of the film industry. To the side of the building on Edge Lane is another entrance, this time representing the sex aspect of the industry, with not so subtle imagery. Also on Edge Lane are these Art Deco style masonettes built to house the cinema workers. They're still occupied to this day with retail units below. They also hide the not so attractive auditorium exterior of the Longford. Although in keeping with the style of the Longford, details as to who built the masonettes are scarce. Once inside the building there was a foyer of Venetian marble like we just saw still remains. Just above there was the cafe which could seat almost 150 diners. Here you can see some of what you could enjoy there. The special lunch sounds good to me. The National Heritage Report on the building states that foyer murals depicting contemporary cinema scenes are thought to survive behind removable coverings, and that even though the interior stalls area was altered to form a bingo hall, little of the plan was disturbed with the circle, projection room, upper floor bar, lighting rotunda, as well as the cafe area above the foyer all still intact. The auditorium itself is big, seating 1,400 in the stalls and 600 in the circle. That's almost as much as the Manchester Apollo. It's decorated in tangerine and silver blue art deco designs. There was under seat heating and large double seats at the back row where I suspect many first dates took place. It also featured soundproofing as well as air conditioning. Certainly luxurious. The screen in the auditorium also had the ability to slide sideways to make way for a stage, enabling the building to host theatre shows once a week and even concerts. On the upper level was a bar which was known as the Circle Bar during its later years. The first film shown at the Longford was Tudor Rose, starring Nova Pilbeam, with tickets priced at sixpence for the stalls and three shillings for the circle. In 1938 the audience cheered as the newsreel of Neville Chamberlain was screened, where he declared peace in our time, which sadly didn't last. When the Free Trade Hall in Manchester was bombed during World War II, the Longford briefly became home to the Halle Orchestra, who performed there despite the ongoing war. In another anecdote I found, it is said that during a night of bombing, a local man by the name of John Comer took to the stage to entertain the crowd who were not allowed to leave the building due to the bombs falling outside. He later became an actor, appearing in Last of the Summer Wine. 
1950, the Longford was bought and renamed by the Asoldo Group and enjoyed another 15 years as a cinema until the last picture was unceremoniously shown, apparently one of the Quartermass films. TVs were becoming more commonplace in the home and cinema goers dwindled away. Bingo was fast becoming a more popular pastime and like so many of these old cinemas, Ladbrokes bought what was now called the Asoldo and turned it into a bingo hall almost overnight. As I mentioned earlier, in 1979 the widening of Chester Road then meant it lost its grand concourse. In 1986 it became a top rank club where punters could drink cheap beer, play fruit machines and have a game of bingo, but that wasn't to last either. Eventually even the bingo punters were in decline and it closed to the public for good in 1995. Thankfully, the year previous it was Grade 2 listed by English Heritage, therefore at least making any threat of demolition less likely. And so we enter the wilderness years. The building was bought by a local businessman in around 1997, and from shortly thereafter telecoms installations have been a permanent fixture to the exterior. In 2003, listed building consent was given for extensions, as well as external and internal alterations, to convert the building to a theatre-slash-leisure arts facility. But nothing happened. The building remained empty and began to fall into disrepair, a shadow of its former self. Its grand facade crumbling, shown here in 2007. Throughout 2010 and 2011, work was slowly carried out to the front of the building, fixing the crumbling brickwork but cementing over the tiled facade. But it did look much more loved than before, and locals had hoped something was finally happening. In 2011 there were rumours it was going to open up as a skating rink, but still nothing. A rare statement from the owner then came, reading, There have been rumours that it's going to be demolished or turned into flats, all sorts of things, he says. It's still destined to be a family entertainment centre, that was the idea and that's what we want to follow through with. We're looking at a couple of groups, both theatre groups, to use the building. Regarding the concerns that the building is looking shabby, he said, Don't be confused by what you see outside. The auditorium has had a complete repaint and is looking very nice. But still... Nothing. Then towards the middle of the 2010s came the Stratford Master Plan, and plans for the building to be brought back into use, possibly by a compulsory purchase order, were made. The Master Plan read, The Grade 2 listed Asoldo Cinema has been vacant since 1995. Repairs have recently been made to the external fabric of the building. The restoration of the Grade 2 listed Asoldo Cinema building would provide the opportunity for a large-scale family-friendly entertainment facility within Stratford Town Centre. This would support the development of the evening economy and also encourage families to use the town centre for leisure uses. Under the preferred option, restaurants slash cafe bar facilities would be provided as part of the Asoldo site. Works to the rear of the site would improve access to the Bridgewater Canal and take advantage of proximity to this key asset. But, you guessed it, still, nothing. And so we get to the present. Listed building consent was recently granted for the installation of an electric heater delivering warm air to the main auditorium. The plans don't mention why the heating is required, but do note that the building is planned to be used for occasional artistic roller dance. Plans also show indications of a new maple hardwood floor being installed, improved disabled access including a new ramp as well as steps and a proposed new door into the auditorium. As well as these on the plans there is a room labelled proposed scenery room as well as a proposed extension beyond this. Who knows what all this could mean, it's just speculation for now and nobody except the owners and the people carrying out work for them know for sure. Not a single picture of inside the building seemed to exist from recent years. Believe me, people have searched. But then, after digging around long enough, I came across this. This appears to have been taken as recently as 2019, and seems to be from the rear of the auditorium looking out towards the north facing fire exit. You can see the edges of the circle just above and the Art Deco tiling looks to be in good condition. The hardwood floor also appears to be in place. These pictures from earlier this year appear to show activity going on inside with windows that are normally boarded up now in view, and they look to have been a recent addition. Passers-by have also noted activity appearing to take place inside as recently as March, but as always it's a mystery what is actually happening in there. 
For this video, I spoke to local councillor Stephen Adshead, who's told me that the council's recent plans included a public event to consult locals on the building. This is now on hold because of the lockdown. Their aim is to work with local communities and listen to any ideas. Once lockdown is over, this will happen. He also added that a compulsory purchase order is not ruled out at this point. I'm sure you'll agree that we don't ever want to see this happen to such a unique piece of architecture that didn't just only survive the war and a complete town centre remodelling but is also now over 80 years old and still standing proud on Chester Road just waiting for its encore. The building is privately owned, I get that, but it was a building built for the community and it lies empty when it has so much potential. It should be something every Stratfordian is proud of seeing in their town, not an oddity that's fallen into obscurity. So, there we are. The best outcome in my opinion at this point could be something like what's happened with the plaza in Stockport. A building of a similar age with a similar story, but more fortunate in that it underwent a multi-million pound restoration, funded in part by a national lottery grant. It's now a cinema and theatre showing classic films and staging live shows and with Stretford Town Centre currently undergoing a transformation of its own with new bars and restaurants opening up, something like what they've done with the plaza would be a welcome addition, but only time will tell, or maybe it won't, we shall see. Thank you very much, Dean. That was brilliant, weren't it? I'm really proud of him for that, really, really good stuff. And the song that he played in it was called Baby Blue, which is one of his songs. Now, when he first sent it to me and said, Baby Blue, I was like, why have you called the song that? And now I completely get why he called the song Baby Blue. So thank you very much, Dean, for that brilliant video. Anyway, I'm gonna catch up with one of Team Zero in a minute, but it's kind of like not worked out the way we expected it to because he's here. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know I was here? I don't know, I just I parked up down there and I see the black car that looked like yours and I thought, that's him around here. He smelled me. Anyway, Connor's here, which is quite odd because in a minute we're going to try and catch up with Connor, but he's joined us here for now. So, <laughs> are we going to the top? <laughs> you know that there behind us? Yeah. Apparently that there, that is the Medlock Valley. No, it's not. Somewhere over there, the River Medlock starts because that is Oldham over there. And that valley there that you can see is the Medlock Valley, apparently. It's quite a nice view, though, as well. Yeah, I still get to go to the start of the Medlock. Right, I was going to do a feature called Catching Up With Team Zero, but Team Zero's caught up with me. We kind of randomly met here. I said, I'm going up out, said Pike. He said, oh, go on and I'll join you. I was like, I was going to kind of like do an on-location <laughs> thing. <laughs> anyway, what have you been up to? Um... Don't tell us, because he's done a report. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going over to your garden to see what you've been up to during lockdown. Oh, man. Hiya. Um, it's me, Kermit's UK. But we're not on my channel today. We're on Martin Zero's. And the reason why I'm here is just to give you a quick update on what I've been doing inside lockdown. Um, uh, what I've not been doing. Um, and I've also... I've, Obviously, to try and pass the time, I have built something. Um, and, it, I mean, to be fair, a lot of the wood was given to us. Uh, so it's it's kind of a recycled project. But what I'm going to do is I want to tell you a bit more in a sec, and then I'll go outside and show it to you. But what I've been doing in lockdown, yep, is, like I said, I've, I've built something for my son. Um, and I have still been making videos because you can go out for exercise, uh, as long as the walking time exceeds the driving time. But anyway, so there is a few videos coming up. I'm just working on them, trying to make them look as good as I can um, for yourselves. Uh, I hope you're all okay as well. Stay safe. Uh, and hopefully this will this will all be over soon and everyone and everything can slowly get back to normal. But let's go and have a look at what I've built anyway. So uh, let's go and have a look now. So... Here it is, this is what I've built. Um, obviously, it's filled with my uh, son's toys. 
I'll just try and see if I can get you a view inside. So you've got like a little cubby space over there for the roof. It's got windows. There's the window. And then I'll show you outside. Porch. Trap door. <laughs> Connor's air conditioning system. Oh, if you wanted a really windy shot, <laughs> I'm stood here in the elements. <laughs> Jesus. Now, if you're not from the UK, you may not be familiar with these things. Uh, it's called a pike, or sometimes they're called follies. And they're called follies because they have no purpose, they're just built for commemorative or decorative reasons. Obviously this is Hartshead Pike, and here we're 940 feet above sea level. Now apparently there's been some sort of commemorative stone up here for a long time. There was a rumour to be a stone pillar up here, and apparently the stone pillar uh, commemorated the fact that King Canute passed through the area. Um, so he did exist, but apparently the tale that he sat on the beach and tried to turn back the waves is nonsense. Uh, but King Canute uh, was born in 990 AD, so we're going back a long, long time. Anyway, there was another tower on the hill uh, built in the early 18th century, early 17, 1700s. And apparently it was made of timber uh, and it had plaster walls. Now, believe it or not, the place was vandalised. Yep, in the 1700s, the place was vandalised. Because in 1750, a court leap was issued. And this is what it said. If any person shall any ways abuse Hartshead Pike, either with stones or clods or any ways deface the weather mark, shall for every such offence lose three shillings and four pence. So there you go, vandalism back in the 18th century. Now in 1751, a year after that court leak was issued, they built a new tower. Uh, it was constructed in stone. Um, and it said it had an inscription on it, which I love. And the inscription said, Look at me well before you go and see you nothing at me throw. Which I think is absolutely brilliant, considering that the previous tower, made of wood and plaster, was uh, vandalised. Now, apparently this tower fell as well, not because it was vandalised, but it was poorly constructed, can you believe? Um, around about um, 1794, a wide crack appeared in the tower structure, 18 inches wide from the top to the bottom, and the tower fell. And so we can move on to today's structure, which was built in 1863 by the architect John Eaton. This time it was built to commemorate the marriage of uh, Edward, Prince of Wales, to the Princess Alexander of Denmark. Um, there used to be a refreshment shop in it and visitors could pay a small fee and they could climb the stairs inside and take the views from the windows. But apparently, again, 100 years ago, it got vandalised and the place was closed and sealed up. Now, another interesting thing is there's a time capsule buried uh, underneath the foundation stone. Uh, and this was uh, contained a sealed bottle. It had local newspapers in, Victorian coins, poetry and documents. So somewhere underneath the building is that little time capsule. So I'd love to be able to go inside there and walk up the stairs. But unfortunately, these days, the place is sealed up. So these two are playing drones <laughs> and they keep losing the drones and they keep thinking each other's is each other's if that makes sense oh for god's sake it's like being buzzed by a massive bee you keep that dog thing away from me <laughs> so connor's got the latest uh is it a mavic 2 you've got there uh, yeah it's a mavic 2 yeah oh well that's the one with the hasselblad camera in it uh yes so let's have a look at the camera on it. You just spin it around. Yeah. And it's got a, I think, is it three axis gimbal or two axis gimbal or something? You can look up, can't it, as well, apparently. Look at that. So that's the bit that makes it expensive, in it? Mm -hmm. The old uh, Hasselblad camera. But definitely recommend getting one. You told me to get a, a Spark. The, the Spark's a good drone <laughs> if you're just starting out. Right. You, uh, you want to get used to flying these. Do you think more of an advanced user like me should get a. You should get another one of these, yeah. 
Okay, so as per usual in the weekly videos, we're going to have nostalgia time. So let's take a look at things from our past. Right, so this week for nostalgia time, I thought I'd talk about very old, dated, three-wheeled vehicles that you just don't see anymore. For me, growing up in the 70s and the 80s, there were certain vehicles around and you just, it wasn't until years later, you just think, do you know what? You never see those anymore. Right, so the first one that you never see anymore, that I only ever saw once anyway, was about five years old, very, very early 70s, walking to the main road with my mum. And remember, I was into trucks and wagons and things like that. And I saw this truck coming down the hill and it had three wheels. And for years later, I only ever saw one of them, and for years later I wondered if I'd dreamt it, if I was confused, did it really have three wheels? And I think it wasn't until talking to an older man in the 80s, he said, that would have been a scammel scarab. So again, it wasn't until years later, until the internet came out, that I was able to look up scammel scarabs. And indeed, it was a truck with three wheels. Just take a look at this. Now, the Scammel Scarab, apparently conceived in the 1940s and built to replace this thing, which was the Scammel Mechanical Horse, which was uh, the replacement for horse and carts in the 1920s, I think, if I'm right. I could be wrong. Um, they had apparently a really good reputation, very popular with British Railways, um, and they could had a really tight turning circle, so when they made deliveries, they could turn around in small yards. Uh, like I say, popular with British Railways. I'm not going to go into the entire history and the detail of them. Just something that I saw once and you never see before. This is the one that I probably saw from uh, National Carriers, which was a parcels company, used them a lot. But again, very unusual and something that you never, never see anymore. Absolutely fascinating and I would love to see one again. Tell you what as well, my dad used to be a milkman intermittently throughout the 70s. And he had a three-wheel milk float at one point. I used to sit inside it. It had no doors on it, and it was very mechanically sparse inside, but three wheels, absolutely fantastic. Another thing that you don't see anymore, do you remember the blue three-wheeled Inver carriage? Now, it had many, many nicknames, a lot of them quite cruel, and we're not going to go into them here. We all know what they were. But you just don't see the Inver carriage anymore. What happened to the Inver carriage? So the Invercar, what were they all about? Well, apparently they date back to the 1940s, 1946, when a gentleman named Bert Greaves, and I'm reading this, Bert Greaves had a paralysed cousin, and he developed a vehicle to, so that his paralysed cousin could use it <clears throat> and get out and about more and be more mobile. He took this idea to the government, um, and they liked the idea. After he'd founded the Invercar company, went to the government, they liked the idea, and these things were almost um, prescribed, if you like. They were seen as a prosthetic. Um, if disabled people could have um, a prosthetic limb, then they could also have this vehicle that could get them out and about and make them less socially isolated. They didn't have steering wheels in, they had the famous tiller that steered it and apparently had to have a very short test if you could drive it forward and put the brake on, then it was fine, you could, uh, you could have one and you could use it. Now there's a story apparently of someone uh, that used to cross the Pennines on the roads to see a family in an Inver carriage and they were so unstable apparently in the wind, they used to take a couple of... Uh, a couple of packs of a uh, couple of bags of potatoes with them to help weight down the vehicle to keep it stable in the wind. And we wonder why they got withdrawn, eh? Now, apparently, withdrawal was as late as 2003, and they were recalled by the government, uh, and it was down to safety issues, really. And of course, there was the ubiquitous Reliant, uh, Reliant three wheeler. In the 70s, I think you had the Reliant Regal and the Reliant Supervan, and of course, Later on, you, you had the Reliant Robin, and I'm sure we all had dads or granddads or we knew someone in the street that had that three-wheeler. Um, but of many, many jokes, but again, you just don't see those anymore, do you? Right, just a quick before we go back to the hillside. This is a picture I took a few years ago, and it's a Messerschmitt. I'm sure you'll know that. 
Uh, this was in a car park. We went for a day out in Yorkshire somewhere, and this was parked up in a car park. Absolutely beautiful, stunning vehicle. So unusual. That deserves a video in itself. And I've wanted to do a video on a Messerschmitt for uh, many, many years since I've been doing YouTube. So if anyone knows of anyone that owns a beautiful vehicle like that, we can do a video on it. But I just thought I'd throw that one in because uh, I don't think I've ever seen a Messerschmitt knocking about apart from that one that was stationary in a car park. But what a vehicle that was, eh? There you go. Weird cars from when I was a kid that you don't see anymore. Oh, Connor, yes? you never actually told us what your next video is going to be. Mm. My next video is going to be uh, about a place called Peel Tower, and it was filmed about, about a year and a half ago. Before lockdown, of course. <laughs> Before lockdown. And Phil, did the you, guy... Did you, you went in, sorry, you went in, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, this is what I was going to mention then. Phil, the guy who took me up there, I didn't forget about it. It's coming in the next two weeks-ish, from whenever this goes out. <laughs> I'm like that. I've got stuff that I filmed and then... It gets shelved for whatever reason, but it happens, doesn't it? Don't yeah. matter, don't matter. Kerbex UK, so he's got a video coming out about Peel Tower, which is just a bug berry in it. Yeah. And you actually went inside, and I want to go inside, and it's be a good video. So anyway, Phil, Phil, if you're listening, he wants to go inside as well. Drop us a tweet. Right, thanks, Kerbex. Good promotion there. Beautiful up here. So you'll see we're right on the side of the Pennines here, on the edge of the Pennines, all that there. Right, so there you go. So from Hartshead Pike on the edge of Manchester. Thank you very much for watching the video. Goodbye to Connor and Mark over there, and I shall see you next week in another video. Bye for now.